being recorded. All right, well, um, thank you everybody for joining us um, on this cold day on the East Coast for a webinar, a joint webinar between the Appalachian Regional Comprehensive Center, the Mid-Atlantic Comprehensive Center at West Ed, and the Center of Innovations and Learning, kind of a unique partnership that we have today. Um, <clears throat> for those of us who are joining us on screen, I have a couple things I wanted to point out. The first one being that we do have some handouts for today that you can download directly from the screen. All you need to do is click on either one of the handouts and then the download button. Um, we also um, have an option for people to take notes if uh, one of the presenters or uh, one of the hosts would like to take notes. We could do that. You can actually um, download the notes afterwards if uh, you found that helpful. And we will be using our chat feature a little bit today so people can interact and ask questions, and that too can also be archived and downloaded afterwards. Um, of those handouts, uh, the first one is one that was created uh, by one of our presenters, Janet Kleiman, today on um, a bunch of different kinds of resources for English learners. You'll find a whole, uh, a whole long list of uh, not only apps, but places that review apps so that you can keep learning and keep growing as the new apps come in. Um, also, some great links to some publications on the topic. So that would be the first handout that we have for you today. Our second handout um, is a list of specific resources, our, uh, specific resources that are going to be organized by the way that um, uh, our presenter, Carolyn Vincent, is going to present the categories for, of supporting English language learners today. I'm going to turn it over right now to Janet Twyman, who's going to talk a little bit about our third resource, which is a web. So thanks, John, and welcome, everyone. And we're going to give you an even more a second. We just wanted to get a little bit of the housekeeping out of the way, just so you know what the various resources are. And so that resource, that third resource that John um, showed up, that web link or that URL will take you to a online collection of curated resources created by the Center on Innovations and Learning. And John, if you'd like to scroll down just a little bit, I just want to show folks that um, what we did for um, in, in preparation for this webinar is one of the collections is on various tools and apps for English learners. But then as we go through the entire presentation, you're going to see we're going to talk about um, content curation apps or collaboration or how to increase active student responding. And so as you can see that there's um, a whole list of courses based on those various categories that we'll be covering throughout through through the webinar. So this is something that you, you guys can access after the webinar or any time if you want to find out about more tools that are available. And I think we're ready to turn it over. You're welcome. I'm going to turn this over now to Dr. Caitlin Howley. Dr. Howley is uh, the director of the Appalachian Regional Comprehensive Center. And um, we are very fortunate to have her here today to welcome us and to introduce the webinar. Thanks, John. This is Caitlin. I'm the director of the ARC, as uh, John just said. Uh, we serve Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. And we warmly welcome you today on this uh, snowy, rainy occasion. Uh, this webinar is a collaboration between three comprehensive centers. In addition to the ARC, uh, the webinar is sponsored by the Mid-Atlantic Comprehensive Center at West Ed, or MAC at West Ed, and the Center on Innovation and Learning. Uh, MAC at West Ed, under the direction of Marty Orland, serves Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and the District of Columbia. I'd also like to thank Carol Cohen of MAC at West Ed for helping to make this webinar and make it available to participants from across the Mid-Atlantic region as well. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter. Uh, first up is Carolyn Vincent, who is doing du double duty as a Tennessee, Tennessee State Coordinator for SPARC and is an innovation and content lead for Market West Ed. She started her 
career as an American Second Language teacher uh, in the District of Columbia. She earned her doctorate in bilingual and multicultural education, and her dissertation won three national awards, <laughs> including one from the National Association for Bilingual Education. She served several federally funded technical assistance centers addressing Title I and Title III as well. Next up is Janet Twyman, who's the Director of Innovation and Technology at the Center on Innovations and Learning. Uh, a career educator, she's pretty much had every job, um, from serving as a preschool and elementary teacher um, to principal and administrator and university professor. She's currently also an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Um, she's published and presented widely on evidence-based innovations in education and the systems that support them. And then finally, you've already met him, but John Ross is also a technical assistant specialist at the ARC, specializing in instructional technology and design. He's a former classroom teacher um, and author of Online Professional Development Design, Deliver and Succeed, which was adopted as a book of the month for July 2011 by Learning Forward. Um, and interesting, he's also, also co-author of the first college textbook to address the new national educational technology standards for teachers. Um, recent projects that are relevant here include a statewide online learning community of PSYOPs coaches, and he designed instruction for a free online course on using the WIDA English language development standards um, that's now completely hosted by the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. I'm going to turn it over now to folks from the Center on Innovation and Learning who will uh, share a little bit more about what their center uh, is up to these days. So thanks, Caitlin. Um, so this is Janet Twyman again from the Center on Innovations and Learning. And we're just really excited and happy to be partnering with ARC and with the Mid-Atlantic Comprehensive Center um, for this webinar because it's just such an important topic and it fits really well within the mission of the Center on Innovations and Learning. And the Center on Innovations and Learning is one of the seven content centers that work in partnership with all the regional comprehensive centers to work with schools to improve teaching and learning outcomes um, across the nation. Our particular focus at the Center on Innovations and Learning is on um, personalized learning and, and changes in classroom and teaching practices and, and tools that actually result in an improved outcome for students. And so even though there's the word innovation in our title, what we're really looking at at our changes in instructional methodology, new curriculum and instruction ways, perhaps various technological or digital tools, but it doesn't have to be so. But it's some type of innovation or change in practice that results in a measurably improved outcome for learners. And so that's what we do at the Center on Innovations and Learning. And um, the slide that's up there right now is directing you to three resources that are at our website that may be beneficial for folks interested in the topic of this webinar. The first one is a practice guide, and the practice guide is mobile devices in the classroom. It's also one of the files available downloaded from the webinar interface. It's the third one up in the files uh, box. But this uh, practice guide was, um, at the request of CIL, was created by Karen Mahone, Dr. Karen Mahone, who spent a lot of time, uh, she runs an app evaluation site called Bellfire Labs that looks at to review apps. And so this practice guide really helps people figure out educators, so both classroom teachers, the building administrative or district level administrative people, in terms of how to select content for apps, what not to select, special considerations with regard to standards or accessibility or even information safety. So we really recommend that as a companion to this webinar. In addition, Karen produced two webinars for CIL that are archived on our site about this practice guide. And the great thing about those webinars is she talks about actual classroom strategies. And for example, if you have one iPad and a group of kids, how do you, how do you get some cooperative or collaborative learning across peers with a single device and those types of things. So I highly recommend it, recommend the webinar as well as the virtual learning rubric that we created together with some of the Northeast states. And it's really more of a statewide 
or district-wide tool to help um, to help systems figure out why they want, might want to do virtual or blended learning, what some of the practices and policies are. So it can be used to both evaluate your blending blended learning or virtual learning system as well as plan for its implementation. And um, that's it for the Center on Innovations and Learning, so we can turn it back over to Carolyn. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Carolyn. Um, it's great to be with you all for a few minutes today to explore some of the opportunities that blended learning classrooms bring to the education of English learners. As you all know, the educational achievement of English learners has been a focus of attention since the first passage of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965, um, first Title VII, now Title III, and NCLB with its focus on aligning content standards and English language proficiency standards as well as um, designating uh, LEP students as an accountability group. All of this has brought a lot of attention to this population and its needs to um, achieve at higher levels. It's always been the case in our field that there have been districts and schools that have attained a high level of excellence in serving their English learners, but at the same time, many districts and schools have struggled and um, those of you in the audience who are ESL or bilingual education practitioners, I don't know if you're like me, but with every education reform that comes along, I ask myself the question of, you know, hey, what can this do for English language learners? What's the benefit for us and for these students? Um, and that's exactly the question that we're going to be addressing in today's webinar. So we're going to um, talk a little bit about some general principles of effective instruction do a little bit of show and tell, uh, do a few demos, and give you a little tour through this fabulous new world of serving English learners in blended learning classrooms. Before we jump in, though, um, let's start with Janet providing a little bit of information about what blended learning classrooms are. Hi, Janet. Um, if you're on mute, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just saying that um, before we jump into the blended learning piece, I think there are several people that, that um, have been having difficulty logging on, and because we have so many interactive gems for folks, do we want to say a little bit again about how to actually visualize how to see the screen, or are we good? Um, we can give out the URL. Um, there is a, quite a lot of interaction going on today. Um, so, Caitlin, can they just um, log in at arc.adobeconnect.com? I'm not sure if that will take them directly to uh, our meeting room or not, uh, but there are a number of letters and uh, numbers that we can <laughs> add on to that that will definitely get them to the meeting. Can, should we post that in the chat, maybe? And then I wonder, oh, I can't see it. Of course, I can't they see won't the chat. I, okay. I'm happy yeah. to, I can read the URL. I can read it several times, and then folks can um, try it out. OK. So the URL for that is arcc.adobeconnect, which is one word, no spaces, dot com, backslash, and these are all lowercase, R9BQ97XVQ38. And I'll repeat that again. ARC, so that's A-R-C-C, dot Adobe Connect, A-D-O-B-E, C O N N E C T, one word, dot com, backslash, R nine B Q nine seven X V Q three eight. We 
hope that you're able to use that link to join us online for um, the really fun stuff we're going to be able to demonstrate today for you. Great. Great. So Thank you. Some people may be able to log on. So um, Janet, why don't you go ahead and continue thinking about blended learning. I don't think we have a lot of people who can chat at this point, but we can add them over time. Sure, absolutely. So as folks that can see the screen, um, we have this question on screen. What do you think of when you hear the term blended learning? And we're hoping that some of you will share your thoughts in the chat box. When somebody says blending learning to, blended learning to you, what occurs to you? What do you think about? Um, what type of reaction do you have that, to that? What do you think is involved? So we're just going to spend a little bit of time um, hearing from folks what they think of when they hear the term blended learning. And then we'll talk about what the, uh, what the researchers say about it. So please feel free to type into the chat now. So um, again, we, there may be ha people maybe having a little bit of difficulty getting in or chatting, or there might not be a lot of people available. So I'm just going to um, please type in as I, I talk about some of the things that I hear from, from people when I talk about blended learning to schools and various groups. But sometimes people um, think that blended learning, you know, it's just equivalent to online instruction. A lot of people think about the flipped classroom because that's a very popular term, or Khan Academy uh, jumps to mind when people think about blended learning. Um, we've got Judy. I just missed her um, last name, but uh, it was great. Just kind of gave us the formal definition, which we're going to share on the next screen. So good job, Judy. Marilyn Murphy talks about a combination of in-person and online instruction. So. Um, that's very, very true. Um, so blended learning, and I will go ahead and move on to the, the formal description. One of the most widely used or recognized definitions is from Staker and Horn and the, the references at the bottom of the slide and in our resource document. But they talk about how blended learning is a formal education program in which a student learns at least in part through online delivery of content and instruction with some elements of student control over time, place, pace, um, and path as well as supervised brick and mortar locations. The reason I brought that up are the things that I want to really uh, point out that, re that identifies or defines <laughs> blended learning <coughs> the two sentences about formal education program. That's really critical. A blended learning environment or a blended learning situation does require that formal education um, program to distinguish it from informal online learning. For example, I'm trying desperately to learn Spanish, and I've downloaded various apps. But that's not a formal learning program that can't be considered blended learning. The other term that I want to call your attention to is further down where they talk about content and instruction. Blended learning really does focus on the content and instruction, and not just the use of internet or online or digital tools. And so just using a digital tool doesn't make it blended learning. It really is a focus on content and instruction. And the blended piece comes from that combination of bricks and mortar or traditional classroom and school and some type of online or digital or virtual component. So that's what blended learning is. And in terms of how blended learning is done, there are several models for the blended learning classroom. And we won't go into a lot of detail or spend a lot of time in this. Folks that are interested in more detail and Examples from across the nation can look at the resources provided. But basically, when you think about blended learning, you're thinking about a continuum from bricks and mortar and online learning. And I said a continuum, but what I really mean is a sampling of both, of bricks and mortar and online learning, from traditional instruction to something that is traditional with technology added, to some informal online learning, and to full-time online learning. All of those, when they get mixed together and there's that focus on content and instruction in a formal situation, that becomes blended learning. And the most common model that most people are used to on the, on the slides, you can see this number one, the rotation model. And so that's where um, in a station rotation, I think many of us grew up in the era in the elementary schools where we had stations and we rotated from station to station, learning different things. It, we just didn't happen to have computers, at least back when I was growing up. 
And so, but that's that same model, that rotation from station to station, except in this station rotation model with blended learning, computers or online instruction are involved. Um, the lab rotation model is where kids actually go to the lab for a portion of the instruction. Um, it, it, uh, um, a lot of people um, think about the lab being a separate place where students may go to do separate things, but when you blend that lab instruction with instruction that's happening in the classroom, you're blending that learning environment. The third one, that's the flipped classroom model. Most people have heard of that, and most people immediately think of Khan Academy. The fact is, Khan Academy, if someone wanted to use that because there, it was instructionally relevant to what they were doing, could use Khan Academy in any of these blended learning models, in any of the rotation models. It's just most commonly used in the flipped classroom, and that's where students participate in a lot of the online learning off-site and come together to the bricks and mortar or the classroom for more face-to-face -face or guided practice. And then individual rotation is where um, kids independently go to any of the different devices or stations and work on the different things that they're going to work on. So again, I won't go through all of these models, but just do know that there are different ways to do blended learning. The Sacred Horn resource is a wonderful tool to figure out how to do that. But what we want to leave you with is thinking about why does this matter? Why do I want to think about how to do blended learning? Um, why do I have to think about or what do I have to think about with regard to scheduling, staffing, resources, student abilities, and ultimately make sure that you're thinking about your instructional goal and that your blended learning model fits within your instructional goal. Thanks, Janet. Um, so when I work with schools, I very often work on personalized or blended learning models uh, with them. And so um, I developed this little scenario for teachers and even for school leaders to think about um, what early steps of blended learning might look like. So here we're looking at uh, Amy Walker with her big smile on her face. And Amy's a teacher who's come to school on Monday, or if, it's, if she's teaching around me today it might be a snow day so she's there early um, and she's there to get ready for the week and as she's getting ready her students are going to study a new unit on slope and algebra and so what she's done is she's been able to access um, her school's learning management platform this is, this is an example of using Edmodo where she's going to uh, post two different lessons from a master course that her district makes available to her students uh, but that wasn't good enough for her, so she's found a couple of other things, including um, this activity online about buying a car, which would use the concept of slope in a real-time situation. And she's also going to post a couple of math games for her kids to work on independently, either um, in class or at home. So <clears throat> she knows that she'll probably have to present some of the information at the beginning, maybe through a lecture, maybe through some modeling, pulling up some different apps or a graphing calculator. And then she eventually wants to get to her return on investment lesson, which is at buying a car. Um, she knows her kids like to work together, so she's going to rotate her kids through the different uh, devices that are available in her school. In some schools, that's a computer lab. Some schools, it's uh, a lab on wheels, so you might have pads or tablets or um, a laptop cart. Um, <clears throat> After, as her kids are getting close to the end of the lesson, she's found a quiz that she can post online. She's allowed to hide it from all the kids um, until they're ready for it, or she can actually make it available throughout the entire time so kids can use it as a practice quiz either at home or in school or, or during times during, the, um, during the, the day if they go to the library or a computer lab. So while her kids are coming in, she knows she's ready for the week. She's got different opportunities for her, her kids to access content in her classroom and beyond the classroom, and that's why you see such a big smile on her face. So <clears throat> with that scenario, I would like to um, turn this over to Carolyn Vincent, who is going to help us understand what does this mean for um, students who are English learners. Thanks, John and Janet, for setting the stage. And indeed, let's now turn our attention to the question of why blended learning classrooms are helpful to English learners. 
Um, and well, let's start with a notion uh, really foundational to our field, that English learners have a double task. That is, they have to learn the same content that all students do, and they have to acquire proficiency in reading, writing, listening, and speaking English at the same time. In order to take on this challenge, it's widely recognized that effective instruction, instruction must be provided by all teachers having contact with the student all day, every day. So on the slide, you see a listing of some of the general characteristics of effective instruction for English learners. Our intention was to select a small number of high-level instructional features that are widely accepted and widely used. Each of these that you see on the slide has implications for teaching language and content at the same time. Each of these may have its place in a blended learning classroom. So now we're going to take a look one by one, first describing what they mean and then showing some of those examples and demos that we were talking about. Uh, next slide. Let's jump in by uh, talking about comprehensive input. This concept originated with Stephen Krashen and represents the idea that students will acquire language best when they're exposed to language in use that's just beyond their current level of linguistic competence. English learners need to be able to understand, at least to some degree, the content and language that's used in instruction in order to be able to profit from instruction and to continue to learn. The goal has been to maintain grade level content and reduce language load. A primary means of reducing language load has been and is using other channels to communicate information. For example, visuals, graphics, uh, the student's home language, and the like. This occurs throughout the instructional cycle, including developing and activating student background knowledge, presenting new information, developing instructional activities, and assessing progress. And this has been known for quite some time, the value of uh, communicating information through visuals, et cetera. Um, the challenge for teachers has always been time to pull the materials together or simply a lack of availability of resources at their fingertips. This is where technology can come in. Technology can make the gathering of materials so much easier in the form of curated collections and search tools. And going a step further, teachers now have options for presenting information in ways that aren't bound to the physical classroom in the school day. Lots of tools make it possible to uh, present content anytime, any place. And that means that more time in the class can be spent with teachers and students interacting. And that's a great thing. So let's take a look at some examples that support uh, comprehensible input. <clears throat> Thanks, Carolyn. Um, so there are so many uh, different kinds of resources that are available. So having the framework of the five characteristics, I thought was a very helpful way of organizing those. And so one way we've done that is, is on one of the, is on handout two, which I'll pull up. But as you're thinking about how can we meet um, the idea of providing, making content more comprehensible to students, as Carolyn mentioned, the variety of different um, ways to incorporate media, well, right now, not only can you find different media, images, videos, et cetera, but your students can also make them. There are many different free and easy website creators that are available for online, and different kinds of tools that combine information very quickly and easily in, in an online setting. And of course, can create concept maps, infographics, videos. Uh, I think every every teacher could have their own free YouTube channel or a teacher tube or school tube and upload videos there to um, help uh, contact their kids outside of the school walls. Uh, screen capturing is very popular, and you can capture and share what's on your screen, whether your screen is a um, tablet or an iPad or actually your monitor from your desktop. And of course, using a learning management system like the one mentioned in our scenario is a great way to help students access content whenever and wherever they need to be. <clears throat> so we are going to, there's something we're going to take uh, just a short time to show you a couple of different um, tools to kind of whet your appetite and get you thinking about um, how you might make content more comprehensive. One way is to think about visual storytelling, and there are a lot of different storytelling um, apps as well as resources available online. One of my favorites is Storybird, primarily because of the beautiful artwork that you, get, um, that you can see. 
So this is actually a short story that I that's all right. Well, thanks for calling at me. Just a second. So thanks. Uh, back to Storybird. This is um, <clears throat> a short story about using phonics that I created very quickly. You can actually share the share the, the document. You can um, have kids create their own stories. The artwork in Storybird is really quite tremendous, and all this can be used either at school or at home. Concept mapping is a great way for you to uh, gather information about what kids know and how they're changing their learning. Poplet is just many, many different kinds of concept mapping applications that are available. Uh, one that I used recently was I was working with teachers and we were trying to think about how do we use formative assessment strategies. And so um, we could think of a new strategy here and just simply link it to um, our main idea. Things like this very often accept images, links to URLs, videos, all kinds of things. And now <clears throat> one more um, one more thing to think about on the screen. Hopefully you're my uh, iPad, and there are a variety of different screen capturing applications that can be used in different ways. I'm going to very quickly use uh, this one here called Edu Creations. We can under Edu Creations insert different kinds of images. So we could actually go to our photo library. Mine will just be uh, pictures of Christmas and cats, so we'll just ignore that one. Uh, <clears throat> but using the tools, the kids can actually write on the screen and then record what they know. So for example, I'm going to press record, and I'm going to say, um, El Gato, the cat, I could bring in some of those pictures if I want to. And then I can actually share that. Um, <clears throat> I can share that video or share that lesson. And the kids can do it. I can do it. You could um, do any, any kind of, in any content area, the kids can then start to communicate with you. So that's just real quick. Um, There are a lot of different um, applications that we've listed on the handouts. So as we go through and uh, we're talking about some of these things, if you see, things, see some that you find interesting, you can also check out the links on the handouts. And it'll take you directly to some of these services. So I'm going to turn this over to Carolyn. Thanks, John. Um, our second principle of effective instruction for English learners is meeting individual needs. It's clear that English learners will be at different starting places with regard both to academic achievement and English language proficiency. So meeting individual needs is a key concern. Students will have attained a range of levels of content mastery. Competency-based curriculum and assessment may need to identify and address content gaps and move students forward apace. English learners in a given classroom will likely always be at different English proficiency levels, from beginning to advanced, and perhaps needing more work in some language domains, reading, writing, listening, and speaking than others. Whether using computer stations, mobile devices in the classroom, or at home, there are a number of intervention and practice applications available through technology that may be useful. Use of intervention and practice programs assumes that student levels and needs have been identified and that ongoing progress is assessed. Assessment may be closely woven into instruction, therefore promoting finer grained understanding of student needs and capabilities and further targeting of instructional activities to make them as effective as possible for each English learner. Next slide.
So thanks, Carolyn. <clears throat> in terms of thinking about digital resources to meet the needs of students, the individual needs of students, there are a range of apps that are available that um, specifically support language acquisition. They could be websites as well as videos as well as apps that students can interact with by speaking, typing, listening to. There are also tools that support language, such as text readers on your screen or grammar checkers. And some, there's some really great grammar checkers that are out there now where kids can actually input their writing and get feedback on readability as well as actual errors. There are classroom response systems, what many people call um, clickers. So we'll look at some of those uh, later today. So those allow you to interact with uh, students without having them to uh, without having them to uh, speak up in class if they feel intimidated or they feel uncomfortable. You can actually also take the pulse of the class to see how kids feel or understand the topic. And of course. Journaling is a big idea, is a big concept that we can use when developing language. And there are online journals, there are websites we can use as journals, and um, at many apps as well. I'm going to um, ask my colleague Janet to share some of the ideas she has around um, meeting the needs of individual students. Thanks, John. So the website that we're going to show you next is called Literably. And it fits in with meeting the individual needs of students in the sense that students are reading passages and it keys the teacher into each individual student's level and what types of reading errors they make and, and also what types of comprehension difficulties they may have. And so John's going to go ahead and go to the literally website to the account that I've created. And so just to let folks know, this is a free online web resource. A teacher can have up to 10 records um, graded per month for free. And when I say records, what, when you see it, you're going to see that it's very, very much like a running record, something that we would do in class. Um, but now it's actually computer scored or computer generated. So John, I'm going to walk you through how we do this demo. John's controlling the screen. Um, what everyone sees right now is as if I created my own class with my demo students and what may be, and I just chose that they were at the fourth grade reading level. Basically, you can choose whatever reading level your students are at. I chose everyone at fourth. Of course, you can individualize that, and then you line up what the next reading may be for the students. We're going to come back to this dashboard. What I want John to do is click on Demo Students. And he's, whoops, if you don't mind going back, John. We're going to, I'm sorry, up at the top, we're going to log in as demo student. I met my instructions to you at the very, very top blue button, log in as demo student. And you're going to click the I'm the student, and he's going to enter JSTWY, which is, just happens to be my account. So what's going to come up after John does this is a passage for me to read. And so I'm going to do this with you guys on screen. And so it's a passage um, about Martin Luther King. It's one that was selected based on my level. You can hit the Start button, John. And what's happening is the, is the program is recording my reading, if it could hear me. I actually don't know if that technology works. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, the um, program is recording the student as they're reading. And so the student's reading um, two or three pages. And then after they read the section, and the teacher can determine if it's a minute timing or a longer reading, then they answer comprehension. So we're done with that. And John, if at the very top, you should be able to, sh to log out as a demo student. Um, yep, you can log out, that's fine. And we're going back to the dashboard. And now, if you click on Demo Student, um, then off to the right, there's Vasco Dibala. This is, go back to that main screen, please. Thanks, John. <laughs> so exactly, click on the story, Dibala, Baboa, excuse me. And that's a story I read earlier this morning that was automatically scored the program. So you can see I actually repeated the name. I said joined instead of joined. I said becoming instead of becoming. So basically it's keeping a running record, letting me know that I read it 97 words per minute, what type of accuracy, and um, all the types of errors that I made with my one-minute timing. 
And the recording button up at the top right, that playback, is where the teacher could actually hear that story reading that the child just did. So you're welcome to um, go ahead and get out of that. And these information, these reports can be sent to parents or whatever um, like to be. You can just hit the back button. That's fine. And um, it also scores the comprehension questions at the end. So you'll see that on the comprehension questions, I got two out of four. And so it's flagged that I'm still working on the accuracy of my reading. Whereas my demo student above got, did pretty well on the comprehension questions and now is just working on reading fluency. So that's an example of a, a free online tool that teachers can use to support individualized learning. I think John has another one for you guys. <clears throat> yeah, so this is Duolingo. And um, like Janet, I'm trying to work on my Spanish, so we're going to see some Spanish examples. But all this does is it provides different kinds of ways for kids to both um, read, write, and speak uh, language that the app will actually pay attention to. So here you'll hear the computer read this sentence for you. And so then I have to figure out what that means. I hope it's this. Oh, I got that one right. It's also very interesting. So you notice that when I spell this, if I don't put in the correct type of pen, it gives me a little feedback that I actually put the four correct letters, but I didn't use the pen yay. So maybe I'll get it right this time. Oops. So now I got it completely correct. <clears throat> and then you can um, actually, I'm trying to get to one. Okay. So here in this example, it's actually, um, uh, reading the words out, but later on it'll ask the student to read into or to speak into the microphone and it'll, it'll score how they've uh, performed that way. So just a really quick app, uh, Duolingo is very popular for learning languages as well as for English learners. I'm going to stop sharing and go back to Carolyn here. <laughs> Okay, great, thanks. Um, our third principle of effective instruction for English learners is peer learning. Peer-based learning has an established place in effective strategies for English learners, and some peer-based learning programs have even earned high marks in the What Works Clearinghouse ratings. In general, though, many types of student cooperative learning activities are a beneficial strategy. These work best when English learners are explicitly taught how to engage in peer activities and the teacher is thoughtful in forming pairs or groups based on the content and language levels of the students. Heterogeneous groups are usually recommended, so that means students with more advanced English proficiency can help those with developing proficiency, or students who have the same native language can work together or grouping strategies may be used that are based on particular student needs or strengths. The overall goal is to promote comprehension and engagement in a wide range of instructional activities, from simple practice to group activities that use higher order thinking skills and all the language domains in an integrated and natural context. So there are many, many different kinds of tools that students can use to work with their peers. There are many different kinds of ways that students can collaborate online or through apps, either synchronously or asynchronously. And these include very common things like um, Google Docs and Office 365, which are productivity tools that most, school, most kids are uh, familiar with when they go to school. And of course, they can conduct a web or a video conference like we're doing right now, even doing free video conferencing through Skype or doing a Google Hangout. Uh, sometimes we forget that there are some really simple tools like calendars that are on our phone or online, either Outlook or a Google Calendar that can be used to support a class. 
and we can actually post announcements and have kids sign up for them and get those announcements through email or reminders in other ways, text messages and such. And of course, um, one good way to help kids work together <coughs> is for teachers, for teachers to co collect and curate the best resources available. And so we're going to show you a few options of those. One of the most popular tools I see in classrooms today is Padlet. Padlet works pretty much like a, a simple cork board. The idea is you post different different kinds of things to the, co the cork board. Here you can see this was a, a Padlet I used working with teachers in uh, outside of Austin, Texas, who are discovering or working on the concept of deeper learning. And all I have to do is double click on the poster board and they can add text, they can add links to URLs. You see they've also added pictures that are on here. So not only can students collaborate as a classroom this way, but uh, students also can do group projects and present all their information this way and just share the URL. Um, Padlet is uh, typical compliant, so compliant with the Children's Internet Protection Act because they don't need an email address to log into it. So teachers can make their Padlets private and share them only with the classes they want to share them with. Um, <clears throat> I did mention web curation, and I'm going to go very quickly and say my favorite web curation tool now happens to be Digo. And um, the reason I like it is, let's say I'm out on a website somewhere and I find some information, like this website about how blended learning works in ELL instruction, which is an article from district administration. I actually have a plug-in on my browser where I can go and I can add this information to my Digo library. All I have to do is tell it what tags to use to save this. And now any computer I go to, and we'll see this will show up in my list, any computer I go to now, I can find those bookmarks. I can also share those bookmarks with groups and with kids, and they can create their own bookmarks for group projects. Um, one of the easier ones that I think for kids to navigate is Symbaloo. Symbaloo uses this metaphor of different tiles in which people can go and uh, I wish you could set up as a launch page for all of your students. So kids who are learning language may not want that text-heavy Digo page to go find something. Here, Symbaloo very quickly, very easily provides just links to different things that kids can get to, such as this link here to VoiceThread, which Janet will talk about later. In fact, it's now time to turn this over to Janet and make sure I don't have her muted. I think I do. Yes, I do. I'm sorry about that, Janet. And Janet, you are no longer. That's fine. That's what I was actually saying. What a great little segue over to VoiceThread. And um, what John is actually going to do is pull up a page from the VoiceThread website because VoiceThread is actually an app, and it also is something that you can use on your computer in the browser. But VoiceThread is nice because there's now a whole community of educators using it. And you can see off to the left under categories, one of the very first categories is ESL. And so there are several teachers that have posted some of their lessons they've done using VoiceThread for ESL. Um, you can see they talk about the lesson. That's the text on the first half. John, if you scroll down to the bottom, what is there is actually just a little um, a little capture of the voice thread that this teacher did with her students. These are kindergartners in an English language learning class. John, you're more than welcome to go ahead and hit the first play button. Um, yep, that's perfect. And I'll talk over it if we can hear it. Go ahead. So here. Students, they've written stories about the polar bear, and now they're describing what they've read in their stories. I'll be quiet now. Let's see if we can hear one. Sure, let's hear one more. It's a little bit hard to hear over um, some of the technology, but basically the students 
we can stop it now, John. Thanks. The students have written stories, and now they're um, talking about these stories or reading their sentences. The great thing about VoiceThread put together to be one book that's produced by the class, so that you have that peer collaboration, and then other educators and parents can comment on the book and VoiceThread. And so it's just a nice little tool that we wanted to share with you guys. And I think Carolyn's now going to talk to us about active learning. Yes, Janet, I am. Okay, so our fourth principle of effective instruction is active learning. Active learning is a process whereby students engage in activities or problem solving that promotes analysis, synthesis, and evaluation of class content. Active learning techniques range from the simple, for example, pausing during presentation of information for students to summarize or clarify what they've understood, to more complex activities like role playing, developing case studies, conducting inquiry, and participation in experiential learning. Further, active learning includes strategies for self and peer assessment to help clarify desired outcomes and be explicit about what performance represents achievement of the outcome. One additional benefit of active learning is that English learners can be encouraged to bring knowledge from their family and community context into their schoolwork. This contributes to cross-cultural understanding and supports the value of the diverse communities represented by English learners in the classroom. So <clears throat> Carolyn mentioned project-based learning um, and project-based learning, which are not necessarily technology um, dependent. However, there are some great technology resources out there to support that. Um, from places such as High Tech High in San Diego, and then and many people are familiar with the Buck Institute of Education. And <clears throat> performance tests are becoming much more popular um, now. They're not a new idea, especially if you're familiar with the instructional design model, understanding by design. They've been out for a while, but because of the new types of assessments that are coming out, there will be more performance-based tests actually on different um, uh, provided online to students as an assessment. So <clears throat> I wanted to share a quick story of working with schools on using performance-based tasks that I thought was actually very relevant to what the kids were doing, kind of supporting what Carol was saying. But we were working with the school of Virginia to un better understand the idea of using a performance task that's complex, that's open-ended, it's real world-based. And after looking at their standards, we needed to come up with a problem which kids use fractions and then use percentages to solve a real world problem and then write something persuasive um, to an audience. And the audience in this particular case happened to be their principal. So we had the kids actually design a new sandwich because the new nutritional gu guidelines came out and they were upset that they had to eat, um, they couldn't eat their uh, white bread anymore. They were eating whole grain. Um, bread. So we gave them a list of different types of sandwich meat and, and wrappers they could use and vegetables, and they actually had to figure out what sandwich they could make in their school cafeteria that met the new nutrition guidelines, also met the cost guidelines, and then they had to create some kind of presentation to um, their principal to show um, why they should pick their sandwich. And at the end, we actually did take all the students' um, projects together and picked the top ten, and I had no idea who the students were, and the principal looked at me and he said, that's really interesting. He said, because we gave them the option to pick what they wanted to pick and how they could put that together, we ended up having, on the top ten, we ended up having two kids who were English language learners and one kid who had an IEP who had struggled with more traditional types of assessments. I'm also going to show a new tool that Jana has introduced us to. Pull up my iPad again. This one's called Utaba, and it's kind of a game for kids to play. So multiple kids can join the game, and when they When they play, they're given pictures, and the first the first kid who picks the correct word for that picture will get points. So let's say that one there. No, not that one. 
Oh, police. Okay, police is the right answer. Okay, over here, yellow gets it right, so they get a point. And then we'll go bird. So just um, a very simple and easy uh, way for kids to uh, work together and collaborate together. You can have up to four players play on the same time. So if you have a larger iPad, this is a great activity uh, for kids. And then the other nice thing about that tool is that, um, of course, with a paid account, the teachers can incorporate their own vocabulary lists and pictures. Okay, thanks. And last but not least, um, a high level of student engagement. So um, you, we've seen a lot of interesting things so far, and it should be obvious by this point that digital learning strategies, English learners, should mean that um, any empty time for English learners when limited comprehension precludes engagement in instructional activities should be a thing of the past. Technology is also often fun, as we could see from the game that John was just demonstrating. But uh, the games, the discovery, the creativity in approaching tasks, all of these aspects are not only instructionally beneficial, but also quite enjoyable. So for English learners, the fun factor means that the affective filter will be low. Students will be less self-conscious in using new language and engaging in instruction when there are many ways to participate and they have a high level of motivation. And last but not least, uh, English learners, especially if they're coming into a U.S. school from another country, may need to learn how to be students in a U.S. school. That is, the procedures and routines of the school and the classroom and study skills that they may need to perfect. Uh, while many students, and including native speakers, may need these skills, they can be especially beneficial to English learners when they are explicitly taught and practiced, and then they will really promote the school success of those students. <clears throat> Thanks, Carolyn. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with the idea that there are a wide variety of games that are available for students to both learn content and to also develop different kinds of skills. But of course, uh, the games should the gaming and the gaming aspect should support uh, the learning outcomes that you want for the whatever content area you're working on. And of course, drill and practice is important, especially for kids who are novices in a content area like language. So you know, uh, we've seen a couple of those different apps and resources they could use today. And we did talk about classroom response systems. And so with the, we're very close to time. I just wanted to very quickly show two classroom response systems that are very popular, that are free, that teachers could use immediately. The first one is um, Socrative, and here we see uh, this is my, uh, I've created this little quiz as, as a teacher, so you can see here, we, here I am as a teacher. I'm also logged in on my iPad, and as I answer questions, the, um, the teacher's quiz will um, update. Another um, really quick, very quick, fun game for kids to do for uh, that teachers can create all different kinds of questions is Kahoot. Uh, Kahoot really is a hoot, and so the kids can you can create all different kinds of. Uh, it's almost like a a game show online where kids can actually create their own questions, and you can create you can put them into one Kahoot, or a teacher can create the Kahoot themselves. So I'm sorry that that's kind of a quick rush through those things, but those are two very popular ways to gather input from kids in your classroom, uh, regardless of uh, I'm going to let turn this over to Janet and just very quickly allow her to wrap us up. Sure. I think Carolyn and I will both do that, but we want you guys to, there's a lot of information, and as Caitlin's been saying, this will be emailed to folks that signed up for the webinar. It'll be available online. So we're going to make sure you get all the information. But we want you to think about, you've heard this presentation, you've seen the resources, now what? What are you going to do? And so we've offered a few suggestions for you with regard to always consider what your instructional goal is, think about your management plan and how you're going to actually do what it is you want to do. The mobile devices in the classroom practice guide should help with that. We encourage you to try the resources from the very, from all the different resource lists we've provided, play with them, experiment with them. 
and then stay informed. Use the blogs and curation sites to refine your toolbox and your practices. So those are some of our suggestions about what to do next. We definitely want you guys to think about what you want to do next and how to do things. And we also have um, some questions and uh, would look for some comments from you guys. Mm -hmm. We are just a couple of minutes over, so um, we could entertain maybe just a brief question in chat or uh, what we would really like to know from you are a couple of things. One is what are the future topics that you would like to see addressed in a webinar? And if you could use your chat function to enter that information, we'd be very grateful to have it as we're planning our upcoming events. Um, and if you can hold on for just a minute or so longer um, after this slide, there will be a link to an evaluation. Your feedback is extremely helpful to us. Um, we apologize for the technical difficulties and um, otherwise look forward to hearing from you. So let's see, um, we've got a few things that are coming in in the chat. Oh, well, that's nice. You guys are so nice. Um, Okay, wonderful. And don't forget, of course, that this will be archived. So you can go back at your leisure to review. And I believe I've seen in the chat that several people have asked for information to be sent through email. So we'll certainly do that. Thank you so much for your participation today on a snowy day on the East Coast. I hope the sun is shining where you are. Okay, thank you, everyone.